Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. and locally administered by Brian Powers, who is our cameraman today. Today's date is the 15th of July, 2019, and we have the honor and privilege today of interviewing Vietnam War veteran Henry G. Lubbers. And Henry, hey. it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Pleasure to meet you too, Ray. Thank you for the interview. Uh, and incidentally, this interview is being conducted at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library at 9th and Walnut Streets in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, okay, do I call you Henry or Hank? Like I said, whatever you'd like to call me. Okay. Just don't call me late for dinner. Okay. Uh, Hank, if you would tell us uh, your date of birth and, and where you were born. Sure. July the 8th, 1947, Hamilton, Ohio, Mercy Hospital. I see. And your parents' names? My dad is Henry, or was Henry, um, so I'm named after him. And um, my mother was Madeline, and uh, she was born and raised in Middletown. My dad was born and raised in Hamilton. And what was your mother's maiden name? Averdick. Aber Aberdick, yes. Uh -huh. And what did your father do for a living? My mom and my dad were dance teachers. They owned a dance studio in Hamilton, one in Middletown, and one in, uh, in Monroe. And my dad started his business in 1932, which I cannot think of a more inauspicious time to start a business, but he made it work all the way up until he retired in 86. What was the name of their dance studio? Luber School of Dance. Luber School of Dance. Yeah. I see. Well, you've got a, a lot of people in those northern counties have to know your family name, sir. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My grandfather ran a bar, owned a bar, so there were a lot of people that, oh, yeah. <laughs> that knew us. And what was your grandfather's name? Uh, Henry George. I, I was actually named after him, uh, but my dad was named after him too, so. And uh, what bar did he own there? L Luber's Cafe, and it was on uh, Grand Boulevard in Hamilton. In Hamilton? Mm -hmm. I see. And his wife's name, your grandmother? Uh, Rosalia. And her maiden name uh, was Zare. And then uh, she got married and her husband died. So she was a widow when my grandfather married her. So. And uh, your maternal grandparents, who? Uh, my maternal grandparents were George Averdick uh, in Middletown. He was a steel worker at, at uh, the Armco plant. And my grandmother, who I never met because she died in 44, was uh, Fanny, and her maiden name was Fisher. And they were all from Cincinnati, originally. I see. Um, you were telling me before the interview that your family originated from Germany? Yes, both sides. Uh, within probably 50 miles of each other, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. uh, my grand, uh, my mother's family was from Osnabrück slash Odessa, Germany, and um, they were landowners apparently at some point in time. And uh, my father's people were from um, Osnabrück, right around there somewhere, all in the state of Hanover, Lower Saxony in Germany. I see. And um, they came here uh, roughly? Uh, my, my mother's grandfather came here in 1857 or 58. Uh, from, he left from Bremen and then landed in Baltimore and then joined his older brother here in the tri-state. Um, my dad's family came after the Civil War around 1879 or 1881. I'm still trying to pin that one down. Mm -hmm. I really am having a problem with that. But that's when they came over. I see. And did you have any brothers and sisters? Nope, I'm an only child. I see. And uh, what church did you folks belong to? Uh, my parents uh, were best friends with whoever was Pope. Were you Catholic? <laughs> best friends with whoever was Pope, huh? <laughs> I see. What church did you go to? St. Stephen's Roman Catholic Church, Hamilton, Ohio. It's now called St. Julie's and it's the Spanish Latino community church more now than anything else. I see. 
And uh, what schools did you attend? I attended St. Stephen's Elementary, uh, then Harding Junior High, then Hamilton Taft High School, and then Miami University, and then Uncle Sam's schools, and then I got my master's at Miami. I see. Um, did you play any sports while you were in high school? Not a drop. I was mostly in theatrics and, and, uh, and, and choir. I see. Yeah. Um, did you have any uh, part-time jobs and things like that growing I, up? I worked for my dad's studio. I, see. So I did not have an option. <laughs> you want to eat? You go to work. So I taught, um, I taught little kids how to tap dance and at the uh, ballroom lessons I was the guy assigned to the girls who would not get asked to dance. <laughs> so, go get her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when did, uh, when, did, when did you graduate from uh, high school? 65. 1965, that would be June of June, 19. yes sir. And how old were you then? I was technically 17, but just a couple months shy of 18. I see. And uh, did, uh, what did you do immediately after high school? Well, I was accepted at Miami, so I knew where I was going. So, I mean, I, I went to school at Miami during that summer to get um, some credits out of the way that were more difficult courses. The flunk out courses got them mm -hmm. out of the way, and then I started full-time September of 65. I see. And how long did you go to school there before being interrupted? I, four, four years. I graduated. Bob Hope was, my guest speak, was a guest speaker at my graduation. And I thought, this is ironic because I knew damn good and well I was going to see him someplace else. <laughs> I was going to say, hey, I'll see you in Saigon, but, but that would have been inappropriate. So, so right after that, uh, they caught up with me. And um, I went in September of 69 uh, into the Army. I see, so you graduated in June or? Uh, actually, April. Uh, April. We, we were on a different system then, and I got out in April, and I, I just worked till they found me. So you uh, graduated in April of 1969 from Oxford? Yes. In Oxford, Miami and Oxford. Roger Ohio. that. What did mm -hmm. you major in? Um, secondary education history, which is what I did for a living after the Army. Mm -hmm. And um, were you drafted? Oh, yeah. Okay. But I, I bought. I was classified 1A, so when I got back to the draft board, when they dropped us off, I, I mean, I knew I was gone. So I, I asked the draft board, I said, if I volunteer, can I pick a reasonable amount of time? And they said, yeah, we can do that. I said, I'll go in September. This was, this was late June, or July, late July. So technically I volunteered, but it was well, yeah. a gun to my head. And so. so uh, so technically, what was the date of your induction? I think it was the 29th of September, or, or the 28th, somewhere around there. 20, okay, around the end of September 1969. Mm -hmm. where, did, where did you join it, and what location? I was, uh, was down here at uh, uh, the government, uh, the federal building. Government Square. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sworn in, and, and actually, I'll just take a sidebar on this. When they swore us in, they said, we're gonna call your name, and I know you all pledge to defend the Constitution, but that doesn't really matter. When we call your name, you have to take a step forward. I'm like, okay, so they called my name, and I took the step forward. The guy next to me had hair down to here and a long fringed jacket. I mean, we're talking hippie stereotype. And they called his name, and he didn't do a thing. And they called him three times, and I went, Jesus, God, there's an actual draft resistor standing next to me. <laughs> couldn't believe it. And they told him, you're dismissed. The FBI will be talking to you later in the week. And we all guessed he got in his car and drove up to Detroit, <laughs> across the river. Across to Canada. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But that was, that was, that was funny. That was well, well, no, it wasn't funny. It was strange. It was yeah, just, that was one way of weeding them out, though, right initially. I guess. <laughs> Perhaps the first time we've heard that one. At, uh, so you're inducted here in Cincinnati at the Government Square, mm -hmm. government, government building. Where do they send you from there? Fort Dix, New Jersey, the Garden State. And uh, basic training there? Basic training for eight weeks. And uh, 
Tell us about your training there. Oh, it's, it was thorough. I mean, they, they you know, it, uh, I taught high school with a guy who was the uh, uh, weight and strength coach for the Cincinnati Reds when they won the, the pennant back in, the, in 91. And he said, oh, when, you're, when you're working with pitchers, the first thing you do is you break them down so you can build them back up the right way. And that's what the Army did. I mean, they broke me down. I'm not Hank anymore, I'm private. And uh, they, uh, they taught me how to shoot, and, which I'd never done before in my life. They hand-to-hand -hand combat, the whole, whole nine yards. And uh, I was in excellent physical condition. And uh, that was that, yeah, it was, it, was, it was good training. How tall were you when you went in the military? About right what I am right now. What, I weighed less. What was that? I, well, right now I'm about 196, and I think I was 153, something like that back in those days. So your, uh, your training then at Fort Dix was eight weeks, and uh, it was mostly physical and, uh, yeah, and yeah. small arms fire? Small arms fire, yeah. Squad tactics at a very primitive level. I see. Uh, and after your eight weeks training there, what happened? Well, I had, you know, they always, they always ask when you're drafted, what would you like to do in the Army? <laughs> so I said, I'd like to do military intelligence. I always thought that sounded interesting. And by God, they gave it to me. Uh, so I, I, um, I left Fort Dix and went to Fort Hollibird, which was then the intelligence school um, in Baltimore, Maryland. I mean, literally in Baltimore. Downtown Baltimore. Damn near. I was in the Dundalk region of Baltimore. So um, uh, that's where they held the Watergate uh, prisoners or suspects after, uh, you know, like, um, well, not John Dean, but, uh, um, oh, it doesn't matter. There were several of them kept where I actually had lived for a while. So, yeah. Um, and how long a course was that? My course was 12 weeks. Um, there's a, I was, for simplicity's sake, I was a photo interpreter. They gave me photographs, aerial photographs, and I was supposed to spot targets and be able to plot them and measure them, identify them. Uh, and we also worked with uh, radar imagery, which I never saw in Vietnam. We worked with uh, uh, oh, all kinds of things they showed us how to do that we never used in Vietnam, but, but the basics that they taught me. Then there was a, an interrogation school, a counterintelligence school, and a school called Order of Battle, which you construct the enemy units, internal organization, and their commanders, and try to develop who and what they are. So, so that all works together. Um, in my case, in a detachment, usually it's a, a bigger unit, but uh, uh, we had four shops, and they all would like cross feed on each other and then deliver a quote picture, unquote, for the commanding officer. And that was 12 weeks? Of 12 weeks for me, other, other courses were longer. Some were, might have been shorter. Hmm. Didn't have much connection with any of those guys and what they were doing. So. Right. And uh, what rank are you while you're going through the I was uh, promoted, I was a PFC when I started, and I was promoted to Spec 4 E4, and then uh, that's, that's the rank I took over to Vietnam, and then I was promoted to E5. You, uh, so after the 12 weeks of training, um, where did you, uh, where did you go? Your next well, step. Oh, after the training, um, I was on TDY, temporary duty, um, for some research that they wanted to do with imaging and identification. I was like three or four days in Washington. Then I went home for uh, two weeks and then I shipped out. And uh, when did you ship out the date? I, you know, I couldn't tell you the exact date, but it was, uh, oh gosh, it had to be late March, no, no, uh, mid-April, mid-April of, six, of, uh, of uh, 60, uh, I'm sorry. 1970? 70, thank you very much, yeah. old age. And uh, when you went home for two weeks? Mm-hmm. What did your mom and dad think about this? Well, they weren't real happy. <laughs> they weren't real happy. My mother, 
uh, like I said, they're good friends with the Pope, and um, apparently he wasn't taking their phone calls. <laughs> They were going to... On the other hand, I got to say this. My parents didn't believe that some other poor dumb son of a gun should go to Vietnam because I didn't want to go or because I was their kid. Luck of the draw, go do it. Do what you got to do. You're a citizen. And that was their attitude. And I accepted that and agreed with it. Now, you were trained uh, to identify targets. Mm -hmm. to, uh, tell, tell us okay. about targets. Was well, we, we trained on things that we really didn't run into, like um, finding, it was a lot of Korean War photography and World War II photography. Right. Um, so I was very good at identifying Soviet missiles in Cuba. I was really good at that. Um, and, and modern Soviet equipment um, that we could photograph from an altitude for whatever reason. Um, but the VC and the NVA, by and large, where we were, uh, they did not have that. So we would look for really small things like uh, a AAA position, like the, their 51 caliber jacked up to be uh, in any aircraft machine gun. And, and they, there was, there was, there, they would uh, put in uh, a circular hole with a donut top in the middle, which, which is where the gun would rest, and then they had a 360 traverse. So you would look for things like that that would give you a clue. The other thing is, <clears throat> pardon me, if there's a straight edge, a 90 degree, that doesn't occur in nature. So anytime you spotted a 90 degree, something was down there that didn't need to be. And I'm going to give you two quick examples, and I hope I'm not taking up too much time. The only time I ever found anything like that. Um, we would work off of negatives. The Air Force would run the missions with uh, super fine cameras and um, they would take uh, photos this way and this way. So you had dicing shots and then you had the regular longitudinal shots. And if you doubled the, the um, imagery over and used a stereoscope, things would pop out at you. And so we would be flying, looking at triple canopy jungle, which is jungle, another whole layer of jungle, another whole ecosystem, another whole layer of jungle. And it's really difficult to, to see anything. Uh, so I found one time a right angle. I said, Jesus, and marked it down, got, got the targeting, um, sent it in. And uh, we would get the summary, intelligence summary for three core where I was stationed um, once every week. And somebody said, you made the papers. I said, what do you mean? And it says, it says an Air Force uh, bomber dropped um, uh, munitions on uh, Yankee Tango you know, with the, with the uh, registration marks and got secondary explosions. And, and I found it. I was so pleased with myself. I couldn't see straight. But I had a, a, one of the guys who worked for me, when, when the, they sent the regiment home, they sent the rest of us to, pardon me, to finish our tours. And I, I had a couple of months in Saigon, and one of the guys that I worked with in my unit, in the 541st and the 11th, was working strategic bombing targets, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And I had to deliver something to his building, and he said, because I was his sergeant, he said, Sarge, come here, come here. I said, what, 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 what? He says, I want you to see something. And he put down these photographs, and he, it was triple canopy jungle, okay? I mean, tree, tree, tree. and. So I had this, the scopes and I was going up and down and this guy was really good. I said, I'm not seeing it. And he, he said, look right there. And sure enough, there was a tiny little right angle. I said, son of a bitch. I said, what'd you find? He said, I found a North Vietnamese truck park. He said, we got to send in an arc light, a B-52 strike, three B-52s. He said, do you want to see the post strike photography? I said, hell yeah. No trees, no trees. I'm saying not one standing tree. A lot of swimming pools. <laughs> no trees, no trucks, no humans, gone. Wow. And I mean, so, so when you found stuff, if you found some really good stuff, you could do some serious damage. Right. But I only found the one, the one building. <laughs> well, so after your leave, um, 
are you assigned to a particular unit? When I got to Vietnam, I was, yeah. yeah. And uh, how, did, how did you get to Vietnam? Where, uh, did, where did you leave from? Left from Oakland Air Force Base on a civilian jet and landed at Hawaii and refueled when we landed at Wake Island, which I was really fascinated because I'd always read about the defense of Wake Island, and it is a little place, um, and, and refueled. Then we landed at Clark Field and then we, in the Philippines and in uh, Benoit. And the one thing we all noticed was with every stop, they would change crews. And with every stop, the stewardesses got, well, let's say more mature. <laughs> So by the time we hit Benoit, it was grandma and cookies, you know. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. So, <laughs> so you, you landed Benoit, and uh, where is that at? That's just, uh, I think it was north and slightly west of Saigon. I see. And uh, what was your first feelings as you got off the plane? I didn't even have to get off the plane. They opened the door. And it was air conditioned and I was sitting in the back, it was a, a DC-9 and you could see these heads going like, like that, one after another and I said, what the hell? And then the heat hit me and I went, oh my God. And it was like 11 o'clock at night and I said, Jesus, <laughs> oh no. So that was my first impression. My second impression was, and this is just a horribly biased and, and probably racist thing to admit to, uh, what were North Vietn uh, South Vietnamese men uh, at the airfield, and they were holding hands. And I said, remember this is 1970, so I'm far from enlightened. Um, I said, well, I can see why we're losing the war. Uh, well, it turned out it was a custom. It was a cultural custom. It didn't mean a darn thing. But to me, it said, hmm. yeah. well, I learned better. Grew up a little bit yeah. and learned better. So. Um you get off the plane and lead us through your journey from there. Where okay, you real quick, they, uh, they pulled us together and said, uh, we're gonna assign you to uh, a barracks, and then tomorrow uh, we're gonna get you going to whatever unit you're headed for. And uh, yeah, I got a crappy night's sleep, um, heat and everything else, the excitement. And the next day they called me out and two other guys to go to the 11th Armored Cab. And we got on a little bus and we drove on uh, dirt roads and we ended up at a place called Zeon, which had been the 1st Infantry Division's base. And uh, that was, uh, if this is Saigon, we were just north and probably just a tad bit east of Saigon. And it was, uh, it was uh, just on the edge of what's called Binzung Province which is a lovely place. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Iron Triangle, which was a big base for the VC, it was in Binzung province. Um, anyway, got to the 11th Armored Cab, saw everybody was running around. I thought I had the wrong uniform on because I had a green, clean, bright green uh, uniform and everybody else was wearing a brown uniform, uh, a reddish brown. And I found out later, that's just the dirt. The dirt gets in your uniform and. <laughs> I thought, I, I, I was all so stupid. I actually thought I was going to get issued a different uniform. I, thought, I don't know why, but I did. And uh, they said, well, you're going to go to the 541st Military Intelligence Detachment. And uh, 541st? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Small, we were the smallest independent unit in Vietnam, and the 541st was the smallest intelligence unit in Vietnam. And we had, therefore, the lowest priority of anybody in Vietnam. The Viet Cong got to look at the photography before we did. I mean, it was just that bad. And um, so we also uh, uh, would uh, fly our own missions if we needed to. If it was like, really, right now, got to know, we just got in a chopper and, and did our own stuff. But uh, that's, that, that, was, that was my introduction. And uh, uh, <laughs> my lieutenant, arrived about the same time I did. And we were, uh, they, they sent everybody who got into the cab, they, and they did this uh, across Vietnam, everybody did this. They had a school to get you acclimated, to teach you how the unit functioned, what they did, what not to do, you know, that kind of stuff. It was a week long course. Uh, and I, I met my Lieutenant, LT Bell. 
Lieutenant Bell. And he was going to be an English teacher, just graduated from college, and I was going to be a social studies teacher, and just graduated from college. So we, we were like that. And uh, L.T. Bell <laughs> said, he said, you know, Hank, uh, when we drove to, to Fort Washington to take the flight over, my wife and I, I seriously thought about going to Canada. And I thought, oh, God. <laughs> What have I gotten into? <laughs> but he was straight up. I mean, he didn't go. He, he just toyed with the idea. <laughs> there were a lot of unhappy people in 1970. So um, <laughs> that was that. No. Anyway, so I went through the school, and then I, I uh, took my place down in the uh, intelligence bunker where I worked and uh, looked at pictures. Now, when you would go out sometimes and, and take your own, you took your own pictures? I did, yeah, I was trained to, I, I went to a special school in Vietnam to take aerial photography. And uh, w tell us about, what kind of a plane were you flying? No plane, air, airplane, uh, or helicopter. I would, I'd fly in uh, what was, we called it a loach. I think it was called a cayuse officially. And it was, it looked like a pregnant tadpole. I mean, the, there was this huge bubble with uh, pilot, co-pilot, and then two passengers, and then the boom and the tail. And uh, when we went, as long as it was available, they would send a Cobra gunship. Uh, I forget which one was which. I think the Cayuse, the, the little pregnant dragonfly, was um, a white bird, and the uh, Cobra was the red bird, and it was called a pink team. And their, their real mission, their real job was not to fly me. Their real mission was to go down and spook the enemy. So the Cayuse would go down and go treetop and try to draw enemy fire. And if he did, he'd break. And then the Cobra would come out. And the Cobra had rockets and mini guns and, uh, and uh, all sorts of pain. And they would just obliterate an area. So. I always felt pretty good on the off chance we got shot down. We had Redbird up there um, flying shotgun. And, and, and I'll, I'll just add this. I was not in any, I really did not suffer. I was not in any serious danger 99% of the time. Um, but it was just me and the pilot. And I always thought, you know, if he gets shot, there's only one of us who knows how to fly this thing. I haven't got a clue. They told me to keep your hands off the instruments. So, I said, <laughs> so that always worried me a little bit. <laughs> oh. And, and, and when, we, when we'd go down treetop level, because he would find some, he'd say, hey, there's something here you need to take a picture of. So, and, and their vision was really good. We'd go down to the deck, and I mean to tell you, we were jinking, you know, it's, it's like up and down and over and around. God. It, it would make me air sick, to be honest. And, and you can't puke out of a moving helicopter. <laughs> not, at, least, at least not to clear the door. You can get right up to the door and then it comes back. <laughs> and, and that always caused that guy to laugh. <laughs> I could hear him over these going, <laughs> Sarge, you, <laughs> you okay? <laughs> I think he did it on purpose. Uh, I really do. <laughs> so, uh, you, so you would take the pictures and then go back and uh, develop them? Yeah. Uh, and that was only if there was um, a got to have it right now moment. Um, one time, uh, our regular photographer, the guy who was actually assigned to do the job, was flying with um, the uh, uh, school. Uh, XO of the, of the regiment, and uh, they got an emergency medevac call. We had, we had a scouting unit um, that would go in and on foot to, to track the VC or the NVA, and they got ambushed. And uh, uh, this guy, Daryl, and I'll make a quick story out of this. Yeah. His name was Daryl Horn from Indianapolis, and he was our unit aerial photographer. And the reason they picked him was, and I am not making this up, is his civilian job was taking baby photographs at a kiosk in a shopping mall. 
Somehow that translated into it. Anyway, Daryl said guys came running out of the bush with a big body bag and they threw it on the floor of the chopper and it was a dead GI. And uh, uh, so the colonel of the regiment, who's, who's Colonel Starry, Don Starry, who's a fabulous officer, um, he said, we're gonna go in and clean house. We're gonna go in there and find those bastards and kill them. Um, and uh, they mentioned it, my, my Lieutenant Bell mentioned it to Daryl that he needed to go up and take photographs. And he, he said, I gotta go on sick call. I don't feel well. So, so the old team Bell came up to me and he says, guess what? I said, what? He said, you're going up. I said, okay, where am I going? He says, where the ARPs got hit. And I went, oh, <laughs> good. Anyway, long story short, I'll bet you, I'll bet you that mission cost, in 1970 dollars, cost $15,000. And I took the pictures, we developed them, we got the stuff, got stuff marked on maps, and they canceled the operation. So. Uh, something else came up, some higher priority came up. We never did go there. Uh, I, uh, so I thought, well, okay, good use of money. <laughs> what area are you operating out of when you're taking those pictures? I mean, what Bin area? Zung, um, uh, we're, oh, at Xeon Air Base, or I'm sorry, at, at Xeon Base, they had their own airfield. Uh, we had um, attached to the 11th our own aviation company. And um, uh, so, we literally just walked down the road and would hitch a ride, they'd arrange it, and off you'd go. It was just that and simple. what area were you photographing towards? Uh, oh, oh, you mean in, in, uh, in oh, I, was, I was definitely in Binzo province. Uh, right now, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Um, I had the map in front of me for two days studying it because I, there were certain things I wanted to make sure I got, but uh, it was definitely Binzo province. Now, the cab worked all the way up um, to the border of Cambodia. And in fact, when I got there, two days after I got there, we invaded Cambodia, and the 11th Armored Cab was the spearhead of the invasion. We were the first unit to go in. And so there were guys from my unit, intelligence guys assigned to the squadrons, and uh, uh, they said, uh, when they came back, they said, Jesus Christ, it was hot and furious. <laughs> because we were overrunning their supply bases and they did not want to give them up. So there were some big fights. Uh, I didn't participate. I was in the rear with the photographs. But, um, and, and the funny thing is, every time we'd identify something that looked good, they'd already overrun it. <laughs> we, they'd, they'd radio back and say, we, we went through it already. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so, what are you gonna do? Uh, you mentioned uh, Colonel Starry yeah. and uh, Lieutenant Bell and Daryl. Daryl Horn. Daryl Horn. Specialist Horn. He's a good guy. Now, any other uh, folks you remember from your outfit? Oh, God, yeah. Well, I, um, I'll back up a minute. The 11th Cap, now I had, I had nothing to do with this, nothing, but it was considered an elite unit. Now, if it was, I brought the curve down. but. Uh, it was the assignment that any armor officer who wanted to be an armor leader wanted to be in. We had General, uh, at the time, Colonel George Patton Jr. was a commanding officer of the 11th. And obviously his reputation, at least his, and his dad's reputation are well known. And Colonel Starry, uh, who was our CO when I was there, went on um, after the war, uh, I think he retired as a three-star, and uh, he developed almost all the doctrine that um, the Army used to rebuild itself from the fiasco that was Vietnam to the ass kickers that was uh, Desert Storm. And um, he was, um, Outside the military, probably people don't know him or ever never heard of him, but he was he was it. And they used to call uh, in the officer corps. They used to call the 11th the Black Horse Mafia because almost everybody who commanded the 11th in Vietnam got a star or two or three. And uh, so most of the 
larger scale officers were fast track. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we had really good leadership, really good leadership. Uh, my, my major, um, uh, and I just forgot his last name, but we always called him Major Major after Catch-22. Um, <laughs> he did not know that. <laughs> He was a prick, but he was a good leader. I mean, you didn't like him, but you knew what he was talking about was the straight stuff. You don't have to love them. You just got to understand that they're not going to screw you over and they're going to treat you fair, but you screw up, maybe the hammer's coming down. Um, and um, LT Bell was the same way. I, I had a marvelous, super good mentor, um, a warrant officer, uh, and Mr. Thomas was his name. I never called him anything but Mr. Thomas. Um, he, I, I ended up becoming the NCO in charge of the shop, and they had to promote me uh, from spec four to sergeant. And I was only been in the army nine months. I didn't know the first thing about being a sergeant. I did not know the first thing, but I was the only one eligible. Everybody else had gone home. Um, and so Mr. Boone just, because he'd been an NCO before he was a uh, warrant, and he said, okay, now this is what you need to do. He never yelled at me, never lost his temper. If I, sorry, I almost said the wrong word. If I screwed up, uh, he would say, oh, okay, no, this is not the way you want to handle this. And uh, Mr. Thomas was, a, God, he was. That was a warrant officer. Yeah, 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 he was great. And if, if I needed backup, he backed me up. I, I was um, sent to a, top secret meeting because they were going to take the 3rd Brigade of the 9th Infantry Division out of the Mekong Delta up to Xeon where we were and then rotate everybody home or to a different unit because they were withdrawing. So uh, they wanted representatives from everybody in the 11th so that we could, you know, do this in a seamless fashion. And um, LT Bell said, you're going and Mr. Thomas is going. Oh, so I took a seat in the third row, sat down, and there was a two-star general doing the briefing, and he looked over at me with my little sergeant's stripes on my collar, and he says, Sarge, what are you doing here? Uh, sir, I was told to be here. Well, there was nobody under the rank of captain, except for Mr. Thomas and a couple other ones. And Mr. Thomas stood up and he said, Sir, we're under orders from blah, 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 and the general wasn't happy, but he said, okay. And I said, oh, thank you. Because <laughs> mm. two-star generals, you don't want to make them mad. Right. But uh, yeah, so, so I'm sorry, I lost my track. No, no. Um, what was the meeting about? It was about coordinating the arrival of the 3rd Brigade of the 9th with the existing 11th Armored Cav, where people were going to stay, how we were going to rotate around the facilities. We had a little PX, so everybody couldn't pile in the PX at the same time. Uh, you know, little things like that. Um, while you were there in Vietnam, were you physically ever sent into the jungle? Or, or? Nope, never once went into the jungle. I um, went into a rubber plantation, which was just as dangerous. Um, we. I mean, I think, I think uh, it was part of the Michelin system. I'm not sure, uh, but it was, a, it was a French owned rubber plantation and it was off the beaten path. And we, uh, I went with uh, our squadron. I was out at a fire support base at that time. And I went out with the squadron uh, S5 civil, civic action guy and me and um, one of my other friends, um, his name was Scoville, and our, our, our translator, who we called Chuck, Sergeant Yao, and the four of us went out armed with M16s and a whole lot of stupidity and went to this um, rubber tree plantation and uh, wanted to interview the manager because we had high suspicions that the Viet Cong, the local VC, were taxed in this place. And that happened all the time. They'd fork over money and you know, leave us, leave, leave you alone. You give me piaster, we, we walk away. 
and, and then at the same time, they would, they would booby trap trees and um, things. So when an armored personnel carrier would go through, not a tank, didn't work as well on a tank, but it, we were mostly APCs, M113s, if you, if you know those. Um, there would be the, uh, the driver, and then the turret commander, and then two guys with uh, M60 machine guns, and um, maybe a fifth and sixth guy. And when I rode with them, I would always ride in the back uh, with, with, the, with, with, with the machine gunners and the other guy. And, and they would put a claymore mine, a Chinese claymore, up in the trees and, on a tripwire. So when a, a APC came along and tripped it, 2,000 steel balls come flying down and scrape the top of that APC like you'd scrape butter off of bread. And everybody was killed, wounded, or otherwise incapacitated. So we knew they were there, and we were really strongly sure that this guy knew where they were, and uh, there's only so much you can do, because uh, there's witnesses. There was a Frenchman there, and, and I'm sure he was saying in French, shut your mouth, nod and smile, take them on a tour, and then send them out of here, because the Frenchman didn't want his property destroyed. And so they gave us a song and dance, they gave us a song and dance, and we took a little tour and went out into the um, brush and uh, the, the uh, rubber tree plantation itself. And then we came back, this is almost funny, we came back and we were getting back into our Jeep and shots rang out. I mean, it was like pop, 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 and we were all prone. And I'm, I'm laying there with this M16 and one magazine, <laughs> 18 rounds, that's all I had. Um, and Chuck, the interpreter, didn't have anything, and the officer had a, a 45, and, and Scoville had a, a 16 with 16, 18 rounds in it. Uh, and I'm thinking, this is going to be a hell of a jolt. Local boy killed in plantation fight. <laughs> you know? And uh, there were no more shots, and we looked over, and there were three girls who were the um, militia guards, and uh, they had popped off the rounds to watch us jump. And they were laughing their ass off. And Chuck got up, and I don't know what he said in Vietnamese, but I'm sure it wasn't, well, that was a jolly good joke, girls. Well done. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think he was giving them seven kinds of hell and telling them who their mother had sex with lately. <laughs> you know, yeah. It was probably not. What does ABC mean? APC, Armored Personnel Carrier. APC, Armored Personnel, and you mentioned another vehicle. Um, the M113, it's, a, it's the military number for the APC. Oh, M113. M113. And we had, I'll make it even more difficult, we had what was called an ACAV package. It was a specialty. It, most, most APCs carry a, a squad or a half squad of guys. It's a battle taxi. It carries you in, protects you from small arms fire, open up the back door, and they come pouring out. An ACAV was meant to operate without infantry support. So you had two 60s to cover each side, 50 caliber heavy uh, with the turret commander, and then an M79 grenade launcher uh, to cover the back. And then as we went down the road, if there was contact or afraid of contact, then they would herringbone. Everybody would go like this. So the 60s back here and the 50 could cover this side, or the 60 on the other side could cover this side. The guys here, could cover you from the other way. And so there'd be like seven, eight vehicles, all herringbone um, for mutual support. And that's usually how you traveled down the road. Of course, if you had a tank, it was even better. Um, did you uh, have other occasions to travel in an APC? Oh yeah. Um, uh, we did a couple of road marches and uh, the, the villagers where we were, would come out and um, the kids would all run to the vehicles and they'd hold out their hand and they'd yell, souvenir, souvenir me, which meant they wanted candy. A couple of kids, and I mean, we're talking four-year-olds, would, would do this and this. They didn't know what it meant, yeah. but we all knew what it meant. So we would get this horrible candy in, in the sea rats. I mean, some of this candy had to be made 
for the Doughboys. Honest to God. <laughs> Win with Wilson. <laughs> so I didn't do it because I didn't see the point in, in doing this. But um, a lot of guys would take the candy and they would aim for the kids. And if you, if you, if you actually hit one, you got points. People would, would applaud you. And I'm thinking, well, A, that's not making any friends. And B, you're not hitting them because they're just too damn fast. They know what's coming. I mean, they're like a, a, a major league baseball player. When that ball leaves the pitcher's hand, they got a pretty good idea what's coming their way. So, <laughs> and they'd get the candy and then. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that happened and uh, we, were, uh, we were the first truce violation, uh, Christmas truce violation of 1970. Um, there was always an unofficial truce that we acknowledged started at 1800 hours, six o'clock on December 24th until 0600 oh, on the 26th. So day and a half, unless we were attacked, we would not go out and bother you. And the Viet Cong would normally reciprocate and say, okay, We'll leave you alone, you leave us alone, that's fine. It was kind of an unofficial, official thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know they did not mean to do this. I know they didn't, but, but they didn't have good watches. Um, about 620, 1820, uh, on the 24th, um, they had a recoilless rifle sighted in on our fire support base. And um, they started, we had a village down below us, and they started walking rounds and I saw one house go up, and then the second round landed halfway up the hill we were on, and then everybody started scrambling for cover, and then they walked them right in through the fire support base. They, they hit our first sergeant, um, they hit uh, our doctor, they hit two other guys, and they all four had to be medic medevaced. Um, and, and as soon as, as, soon as uh, uh, the firing kind of ceased or was moving away from us, SOP was you put out immediate suppressive fire, but you couldn't fire to the village because you might hit civilians, okay? So immediate suppressive fire. Um, and uh, that went on off and on for an hour. They, they brought jets in and uh, they flew low. I don't know if they hit anybody. Counter battery fire, we had howitzers firing back in the general direction of where the fire came from. Okay, cut to Christmas morning, and the colonel, uh, lieutenant colonel of the squadron says, We're going to, we want you guys to go in the village. We're going to, it was called a MEDCAP, a Medical Civil Action Patrol, and we would go in with them as cover and mingle with the crowd and ask them questions. So nobody could say, Ah, oh, Nguyen talked to American intelligence. So it was just, you know, we would just say, You know, hi, how are you doing? And, oh, do you know anything about it? So, we got on our armored personnel carriers and, and one tank and went down into the village and uh, what village I, you know i i'd have to look it up couldn't even tell you uh, uh, that mission is in uh, is in uh, a book uh, that some uh, stars and stripes guys put together after the war images of vietnam i don't know who the guys were but i took pictures and they took pictures and they're the same pictures um, of, of stuff, same people are in them. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we went in and uh, so Chuck, Chuck went up and down the main street with a loudspeaker and he said, anybody with injuries, come over to the, the medical track and, and uh, the medics will treat you. We are your friends. And uh, so a crowd gathered and there was one little girl who gave information to us on occasion and we gave her soap, which she really liked. I mean, yeah. I guess it was kind of a rarity. And uh, she said, oh, nobody, nobody there is hurt. I, I said, what do you mean nobody there is hurt? What, tell, Chuck, what's she mean? And he said, why? He said, because the Viet Cong came in a half an hour before they opened fire on you and told everybody to take cover. I said, it's a 10 minute walk up the hill. Nobody came up to tell us. I saw my doctor <laughs> carted, carted, I mean, I'm, he didn't get killed or anything, but he sure as hell got shot. The Sergeant Major had just gotten back from R&R &R with his wife in Hawaii. 
He was back two days, hospital. Nobody came up to tell us. And uh, the woman whose house burned down, and I saw it get hit, she was about that tall. And she was talking to the S5, the one that I went to the rubber tree plantation with. And he was like 6'3 and 230 pounds. <laughs> and she was just tearing his ass apart. And I said, I said, Daiwi, what's she, what's she talking about? He says, oh, it's our fault. Her house burned down. I said, how is that our fault? Because we were the target and she was in the way. I said, God damn, really? He says, and we're going to pay for her house to be rebuilt. I said, oh, you have got to, you've got to be kidding me. But that's how you make friends. No, well, nobody came up the hill, so there you go. I mean, it was... It and that was, was during a truce. Yeah, yeah. But again, I think they really wanted to do it before six. But, you know... <laughs> anyway, that was Christmas. Could have been worse. So now I think we're going to move into 1971. That well, would have been Christmas 1970, if I put well, this down chronologically, right? Okay, uh, let, me, let me back up. Uh, the unit, or my unit, 11th Cav, stood down officially in February or March, I don't remember exactly which, and uh, some guys went home, the equipment was given to the South Vietnamese Army, and then one squadron stayed intact. Um, to have something of a presence in that area. And I was, uh, because I only had a couple, three months left, I was sent to Saigon, pardon me, and I worked at the uh, 525 Military Intelligence Brigade, so a much higher level. And I, did, I had a crappy job filing maps, but they didn't know what to do with me. And the reason um, I went there is because I extended my tour by a week, and here's, here's my attitude that explains everything and gets to 71. I was a two-year draftee. I was gonna get out by September of 70, or 71, September of 71. Um, it's early 71 and I found out that the Army had a policy, if you had less than 150 days left to do in Vietnam, or in the Army, and you left Vietnam, they would just send you home because it wasn't worth the time and trouble to send you to a base, get you in, and then have to out process you. So I extended two weeks, which got me under 150 days. So I knew all I had to do was sit down and file maps until end of April, first part of May, and I was going home. And that was it, sayonara. And that's what I did. I went home and- uh, Good thinking. Yeah, I thought so too. My mother was very proud of me. <laughs> So Christmas of 71, I was, I was teaching high school and uh, on Christmas break and thinking, I'm sure as hell beat last year. <laughs> so when you shipped out of Vietnam, when? It would have been the uh, very beginning part of uh, May 71. May of 71. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you leave Vietnam? Uh, on an airplane? Another commercial jet, yeah. Where'd you fly out of? Um, ton, no, Benoit again. It was Benoit, Benoit again. Mm -hmm. where he landed. And uh, we flew to Japan and did a layover in uh, the Tokyo terminal. And we got back on the plane. And I was expecting to do the same, you know, thing. And the pilot said, "Boys, I got enough fuel to get us to Oakland. Let's say we go nonstop." And the boy, you should hear everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, as soon as we got to Oakland, I uh, went through customs, and they said, everybody who's going to out-process over here, and the rest of you, we're going to give you your tickets to go home or to your next base, and you go over there. And so I spent two days out-processing, got my physical, uh, uh, my, <laughs> my, <laughs> my Uncle John, the one who waited ashore, uh, <laughs> and my uncle George, who was uh, uh, a Coast Guardsman in World War II, uh, they said, they, they wrote me and they said, now, 
I know you're going to be in a big goddamn hurry to get out of that military. He says, but you make sure they go through everything that you got wrong with you and write it down because you're going to need it 40 years from now. <laughs> I didn't. I just wanted out. <laughs> so um, went, then I went to Oakland, Air, uh, Oakland um, uh, not Oakland, San Francisco International, and then flew to Chicago and then to Cincinnati. And my mom and dad met me at uh, Greater Cincinnati. And uh, we went home and uh, I had a bologna sandwich, husband potato chips, and a cold Dr. Pepper. And I was one happy camper. I can imagine, yes. Uh, when you were in, <clears throat> over in Vietnam, were you ever exposed to Agent Orange? I, w <clears throat> I was exposed that you would have to, it was like that, it was never long term. Uh, the 11th cab, we loved Agent Orange because when we did a road march, um, the jungle would come right up to the, the edge of the road and it's shooting ducks. If you've seen the movie Fury, um, when the little Nazi boys blow up the lead tank because they're right on the edge, the woods were right on the edge and they just zapped that tank and, and uh, uh, took it out. Uh, that's the kind of crap you didn't want to have happen. So Agent Orange would clear out like 150 yards on either side. I mean, it was brown. It was brown, and then there was a wall of green. And, and most everybody's pretty happy. But I didn't have to linger in it, so I'm, I'm okay there. I have a very good friend I was drafted with. Uh, we graduated from Miami together, and uh, he was with the infantry. Um, up in two core. Uh, he was an RTO radio telephone operator for his company. He was an infantryman. Um, and he got, he got orange pretty good. And he has uh, two new knees and one new elbow. And they're thinking the other elbow is going to get uh, replaced. Um, have you stayed in contact with any of the guys that you were in Vietnam with? Not really. Um, Couple of guys, off and on. There was, <laughs> there was a guy we, in, um, in my training, and he, he was also assigned to my squad, or my, my, my section uh, in Vietnam, and he was a, he was a butthead. Uh, he told us his ambition in Vietnam was to grow his hair to the length of John Lennon's and to get an Asian whore, pardon me, prostitute, and get naked and do a John and Oko Yono photograph. That was his. That was his big goal in life, and and he was pretty worthless. Um, and we, his name was Beardsley, and we called him Weirdsley Beardsley. Um, and uh, so he he called me up. Gosh, it must have been 1988, and he was seeing relatives in Kentucky, and he looked me up in the phone book, um, and uh, got my number, and, and we we chatted for half an hour. It was very pleasant, but. Uh, uh, Oh, and there was another guy uh, who, was, who lives up in Cleveland, and uh, uh, one guy who lived in Cincinnati. Uh, we, we hung out for a little bit in the early part of the 70s, but then, you know, got married, had a family, had a real job, had other people that yeah. sort of needed my attention. So, I, no, I can't really say. I, I haven't gone to any reunions, although I belong to the, I belong to the um, veterans group for the 11th. For so. the 11th mm -hmm. Armored Cavalry? Yeah. Um, so you got home and your mom and dad met you at the airport. Uh, is there a woman in your life at this time? No. 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 And uh, so lead us through what you did now that you're back. You're completely discharged from the military. Completely discharged. You don't have any medical problems? No. No. Not a one. Um, What's the first thing you do then when you get home? Well, I took, a, I took a week to visit the relatives and everybody got to touch me and feel like, of, of all my cousins, my mother's family, there are three boys. I have, my, my other two cousins were in the Navy. One was on Yankee Station right off the coast. Uh, the other one was in the Mediterranean. They never saw Vietnam. My, my dad's brothers, he comes from a family of seven. I've got lots of male cousins. They were in the Air Force or uh, in the Navy. I was the only one that went to Vietnam. <laughs> uh, just amazing. But my Uncle Charlie, 
uh, not my uncle Charlie, my uncle John and my uncle George, the two that said get the full physical. Um, they were they were veterans and they had been combat veterans, and uh, it was it was subtle, but it was it was like I had joined the club. I had cleared the rite of passage, and uh, I don't think they treated me a lot differently, but. I was real close with my uncle George, and he he'd tell me stories about the Navy that I cannot tell you, Coast Guard and <laughs> stuff he did. But um, <laughs> uh, after that, it was look for a job. Um, I took unemployment because I was eligible, and they weren't hiring people to be teachers in the middle of the summer. I knew I'd have to wait, and. Um, uh, my, my mom was mad because I didn't get hired right away, and she wrote President Nixon. <laughs> Only my mother would think that the President of the United States would give two farts <laughs> about us, a civilian soldier type. And she wrote, and she said, well, I think it's a disgrace. <laughs> and I got called into the Hamilton, Ohio Unemployment Bureau because crap rolls down the <laughs> <laughs> the manager of the office got his butt burned. I said, I am so sorry. I said, I explained how education hires and how that works and it was gonna, you know. Take to September. Oh, God. And I got hired uh, by Lakota Schools uh, in late August. I think I had two weeks before school started. That's 1970. 1971. Uh -huh. And, uh, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. That's quite all right. Uh, my building principal was a World War II Pacific Marine, and my uh, superintendent uh, was a uh, Korean War Navy officer. So the interview went pretty smooth. I mean, I don't know if there was anybody better qualified. I really don't think there was, because I had good grades, and I'd actually published um, a small article in, as an undergraduate, so I was I, I figured I was a good candidate. Uh, and what subjects did you teach here? I taught, um, oh, I taught a bunch of different subjects. Uh, I was, uh, first year was uh, U.S. history, uh, 20th century, uh, and uh, then I taught Western Civ, then I taught um, uh, electives, uh, modern China and the Soviet Union, and um, um, Emerging nations, um, where you would pick selective nations in Africa and Asia and mm -hmm. Latin America. Uh, then I taught uh, uh, economics, which I, I am proud I am proud to say I got into that school. There was no economics course in that school, and I got it in, and I got it made a requirement, uh, which I think was my best thing ever. Um, where is Lakota located? In Westchester, Ohio. Uh, John Boehner, the former Speaker of the House, his children went to mm -hmm. Lakota schools. Um, and I taught, I taught for, gosh, almost, almost 30, yeah, almost 30 years. I taught U.S. military history as a survey course. And it was a, a course for guys who wanted to know about military history and had teachers who knew nothing about how the military worked or about military operations except for D-Day or Gettysburg. And, and we both know there's way, way, way more to the study of military history than that stuff. Um, so I, that was a very popular course. And uh, I think that was about it. I think I taught government once. Yeah, so I taught just about everything. And we, how long were you with Lakota? I was there 13. 35 years. 35 years. Mm -hmm. So you retired in what year? 80, uh, 06, June 06. Okay. Um, now, are you married? My wife died, uh, it'll be six years ago in October. I see. And, uh, and what was her name? Her name was Connie, uh, and she was a teacher. She taught at, uh, um, well, she taught at um, um, Cincinnati Hughes. And then when they made it a specialty school, she transferred to Aiken and she um, well, took- She was uh, working on the inner city then. Oh yeah. What was your wife's full name? Connie Lee Kurtzheiner. 
Uh, it louvers. I mean, uh, at yeah. the end of that, Kurt, Kurt Chiner. Kurt Chiner. Yeah. Yes. And uh, where did she grow up? But she grew up in the West Side, uh, Price Hill, Lower Price Hill, uh -huh. back when it was a little bit better to live in Price Hill than sure. it is now. But yeah. And what she, were what were her parents' names? Uh, her dad was Gus Lester Kirchiner, and her her mother was honest to God. Thelma Jean Ritter, Thelma Ritter, the, <laughs> the movie star. Oh, oh, she, she did. She said, call me Jean, but everybody called her Thelma. <laughs> and she was a piano teacher, and uh, Gus worked out at uh, Evendale at the uh, GE plant, uh, testing jet engines. I see. Um, I lost. Oh, oh. What was your wife's uh, date of birth, do you recall? Uh, June the 10th, 1952. And how did you folks meet? Um, it's funny because I went right past that place on the way, way here. Um, there was a party. My, my buddy and roommate at the time was teaching distributive education, which you may have heard of. It was called DECA, and it taught kids how to be in retail as, as part of their senior year experience, and then they'd work part time. Uh, and he was the DECA teacher. And uh, DECA teachers were party animals. I mean, I don't care, Cincinnati, Hamilton, Fairfield, Dayton, Middletown, they all knew each other and they all partied and they partied hard. And uh, uh, so he said, uh, there's a DECA party, uh, at, uh, it's right off of Hamilton Avenue, just north of, of Northside. Um, and he said, uh, it's an apartment complex. He said, Dad, do you, do you, want, to, you want to go? I said, well, hell yeah. And it was almost the end of the school year, and it was warm weather, sure. So we went there, and there were a lot of women there. And uh, honest to God, uh, people don't believe me when I say this, but my wife and her roommate walked into that room, and they were wearing um, halter tops. And my wife had a figure for a halter top. And um, I said, that's a good looking woman, but she's stuck up on herself and I'm not even gonna worry about it. And I ignored her. And then we were outside at the swimming pool just talking and she sat across from me and was talking to my roommate and then he got up and left and we were chatting and we were talking about teaching. And uh, she taught uh, vocational childcare. She taught all these kids how to work in uh, as, as childcare specialists in, in preschool. And they ran a preschool. And she was dead serious about her business. I mean, she, she was no airhead. She, she knew what she was doing. And I said, well, there's more here than me see I. And what me see I was pretty pleasant. So um, we made a date and uh, as they say, the rest is history. What was, it, what was that date roughly that you met your wife uh, at the party? It was in early June and it was on a Friday night. Of what year? Oh, I'm sorry, 1976. We dated, uh, well, she broke up with me twice. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and <laughs> I, excuse me for laughing. But, but. <laughs> she did. And the second, the sec after the first time she broke up with me, uh, she dated some guy from Ecuador, and he flew her down to Quito, where his parents, who were filthy rich, owned a Hacienda overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and he asked her to marry her, and she was thinking, wow, this is pretty nice. But on the flight home, which is forever, she said, wait a minute, I live in Cincinnati. I don't speak Spanish. I'll be by myself. I don't like him that much. <laughs> and meanwhile, her sister, who was older than her, and she was a teacher too, she was a, she was a DECA teacher, she called me on the phone, she said, you have got to call my sister back up on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so we got back together eventually and uh, like, I, like I said at her eulogy I said I'd like to say we live happily ever after but we got married so, so. <laughs> when, when, did, when did you get married? 79, when, March 31st March the 31st 1979 and she was, she was pregnant nine months and two weeks later I know that exactly because her mother calculated it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what was your first child? 
Uh, we had a boy, uh, January 19th, Robert E. Lee's birthday, uh, January 19th, 1980. His name is Ian, and he is a social studies teacher in Fairfield Middle School. Uh, Creekside is the name of the place. And Creekside. Then, Creekside uh, uh, Middle School. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And his name is Ian? Ian Henry Lubers. I see. He has five children and one foster child. Uh, and uh, did you have any other children? Yeah. We, uh, it, well, she wasn't supposed to be able to get pregnant. That was the thing. So we thought, okay, lucky shot. Um, and then Ian was uh, about a year and a half old, and we, we had a, some friends over, and they left, and we were cleaning up toys from our kid and their kid. And she says, I'm pregnant. I said, that's great. She goes, oh, thank God. <laughs> and that was uh, our daughter, Erin, who was born March 25th, 1982. And um, she is currently um, taking care of three children, um, but she graduated from uh, Mount St. Joe uh, with a um, degree in uh, graphic arts, graduated cum laude. That's right, very pleased with that. How long ago did she graduate? Oh gosh. Don't, don't, don't dwell on that, it just recently or sometime? Oh, ago. it was some time ago. Uh -huh. I'm, I mean, cause she's been married eight years and dated three or four years before that. She met her husband actually in college, but she was engaged to somebody else and did sort of blew him off. And then the first engagement fell apart. Thank you, God, for small favors. And uh, met, uh, met again with this guy that she's married to, who is a terrific human being. I am. What's his name? Michael. And his last name? Schulte. Schulte? Schulte. His uh, parent, his, his father, um, is a co-owner of uh, the company that make us Opoly games, like Cincyopoly and uh, Miamiopoly, UCopoly. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, so that's, that's their family business. And so, how many grandchildren do you have? I have uh, eight natural grandchildren and one Father. foster child who, if she gets adopted, is a grandchild. But they've gone through three or four foster children and. Right. They always get taken back by somebody in the family, so. And um, how many children does your uh, daughter have? Three. She has she has two twins. I'm sorry, two twins. <laughs> that, that's normal. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> it's better than three twins. Uh, she has twins, and she has a, a daughter in third grade at the uh, School for Creative and Performing Arts. So. Over oh, right down here. Yeah, just right down the street. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, before we, uh, Brian has a few questions that he wanted to cover with you, but I just wanted to ask you, uh, is the, the, your experience in the United States Army and Vietnam, would you say that's the defining feature of your life and point of your life? I mean, it sounds like I'm diminishing my wife. Oh, no, 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 But that time, I mean, I got my master's degree from Miami, and you could take all six years I spent at Miami, and I learned a lot, but that year in Vietnam and, and the training beforehand, I went from a, a dumbass little kid to almost a man. <laughs> I mean, I still had some room for growth. I probably still do. But yeah, that was. And how often do you think about Vietnam, would you say? Every day or? Once a week. Hmm. Well. Once a week, easy. Because I have a lot of friends um, who are veterans. Um, a couple of guys I taught school with. And I'm in, always talking to them. And. Um, and, and uh, there's a new family just moved in across the street from me. Um, and the guy's dad was in I-Corps in 1967 and 68, which was the worst time to be in I-Corps in recorded history. And, um, and, and we, we just like, you know, it's like you just got, you just know the guy, he's just somebody, you know, you just hook up with him. And I'm not, not that I went through what he went through, he was in hell. 
I was, I was uh, on the outside waiting list for purgatory. So I was not, not, not the same thing. Well put. Um, we also, uh, when we interviewed Vietnam veterans, we asked them about their reception when they got home. Did you have any negative uh, things that happened to you? No, I can't think of a single thing. Uh, like I said, <clears throat> my mom and dad were there. First thing, I think words out of my mother's mouth. So she hugged me and she said, you'll never know how I suffered. And I was thinking at the time, I said, uh, excuse me. <laughs> but I know what she meant now that I'm a parent. Um, and all my relatives were, were just delighted to see me. And nobody had a bad word to say to me. I know, I can't think of a single soul. Uh, the only negative thing I got was my, my first day teaching school. And I was telling the kids, this is, this is who I am. This is where I came from. And last year, this time, I was in Vietnam. And some little kid said to me, because he was a wise ass, did you kill anybody? And I said, oh, you and I are going to get to be good friends. And actually, we ended up being good friends. That He was just being a smart ass. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the most negative thing I got from anybody, really. So, yeah. uh, Brian, it, uh, I'm sure you have a few questions also. Yeah, just a couple. Um, I was where you were based out of. Was that I Corps? Three Corps. Three Corps. Okay. So, what was going on in Three Corps compared to the other corps? Because there were four, right? Oh yeah. I when I when I taught Vietnam, both as a part of U.S. history and in it, as a part of military history. I used to say to the kids, uh, you can ask veterans, but it's like the, the nine blind men describing an elephant. You know, it's like a tree trunk, it's like a snake. You know, it, it depends on where you were and when you were. Um, I Corps was uh, on the DMZ and, and a major infiltration route, um, um, Quezon, the battle for Quezon, the siege of Quezon was there, the battle for Way. Uh, which was a bloody battle, uh, Marine Corps there, um, and then uh, Two Corps was an extension of I Corps, only mountainous. Uh, my buddy who was uh, uh, got Agent Orange all over him um, was in Two Corps, and uh, they were they were just constantly hiking up and down mountains and around mountains and um, and then things like that. Three Corps, uh, rice paddy fields. Uh, open terrain and then jungle the closer you got to uh, the Cambodian border and um, allegedly right across the Cambodian border was uh, Kajdan which was the combined operations for the Vietnamese um, communists and that's one of the reasons we invaded Cambodia was to try and disrupt that and then four core Jesus God Mekong Delta snakes in the water uh, I mean, honest to God, because I, I had buddies that were in the, in the Mekong Delta, and I mean, I wouldn't wish that on a dog. Gee, but whiz. I mean, I had a relatively sweet spot. And, and, and I will say this, after we invaded Cambodia, they didn't have anything to shoot at us. In, in Three Corps, my tour of duty happened at the absolute sweetest spot where they didn't have much they could throw at us. So you could... I uh, just sort of kick back and listen to them grunt on their way down the Ho Chi Minh Trail with ammunition that, <laughs> that we would hopefully blow up. Um, so th th that's so, so that, uh, different jobs in different spots at different times. And, and plus, um, when, when 69, 70, when the draftees really came in and the military had lowered the intellectual scores uh, to get people in, I heard a talk on uh, C-SPAN just four weeks ago. They said in 1970, most units were either college grads, half college grads and half high school dropouts. There was almost nothing in the middle. Now my unit was mostly college grads. I mean, we had three guys that got drafted out of Duke Law School. Um, they were interrogators, which I thought was appropriate. Um, and, and I was a college grad. Most, most of the guys were college grads. Um, but then in the, in the grunt units, not so much. And that's why my buddy uh, with, the, with uh, Agent Orange, uh, Ray, he became the RTO, radio telephone operator, who was a key person 
because the captain knew he was a Miami, not that it was a Miami graduate, but he was a college graduate. He was strong and he was intelligent. Uh, in fact, they wanted him to go to OCS. He said, no, I'll, I'll, <laughs> that's okay. I'll just become a civilian. <laughs> Thanks anyway. <laughs> Uh, did that answer what you wanted to know, or do you want more detail? I was thinking, where, where you were based at, what was that like? Were there a bunch of barracks? And, and yeah, we actually had barracks. Um, at, the, at the base camp, Zeon, um, it was, it was a, uh, we had a perimeter with, uh, with bunkers that we had to guard at night, um, and, uh, and watchtowers. And then inside, we were uh, in, in a regular barracks. I had a bunk bed uh, with a real mattress, it was a thin mattress, but it was a real mattress. And uh, we had a spare place that we called the club and we had a, somebody, somebody found a pool table. <laughs> and it, was, it was never even, number one. Number two, there were rips in the felt <laughs> and the Q-sticks Q -tips, Q -tips all warped in the weather. <laughs> Which <laughs> there was no chance in hell you were going to do anything, uh, and we'd get a movie uh, several nights a week. I mean, how soft can that be? So, but at the fire support base, I lived in a tent, uh, and we had a, a porta potty, uh, so to speak. Can I tell you this one? Uh, um, there, we, there was a, a four seat crapper um, at each end of the fire support base because we had a lot of people on, at, we had the artillery batteries, and then we had perimeter vehicles for guard duty, and then people were rotating in and out on, on uh, like a two-day vacation, and then they'd go back out. Um, and you'd go in the outhouse, and it was a four-seater, and um, so you know, you'd just be talking to the guy next to you, and it wasn't any big deal. Uh, but we always, we, we'd get around, we'd ask, what would you do if we got attacked, if you were in the, in the outhouse? And that was always a big topic of discussion. Well, when we got hit on Christmas Eve, um, the crapper, we called it the S word, the crapper got hit with shrapnel. And as we were going out on the med cap to go down and talk to the villagers, we, we would drive right past the crapper and somebody had found a purple heart and stuck it on the outside. <laughs> Because it was right next to like three or four puncture wounds. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Just hilarious. Um, but much better than the infantry sleeping on the dirt and, and everything else. They, those guys. Uh, can you see this picture, Brian? I don't want to interrupt you, but uh, tell me about this picture if you can. Yeah, that is me in front of our tent. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, it was a, a, a four man tent. Uh, the uh, thing that's coming out right on this side was uh, an underground shelter uh, that we had dug with, with uh, sandbag covers uh, in case we got bombarded, which we did on, on Christmas Eve. And then uh, the, the thing to the left side of it was our shower. And uh, that bucket, uh, we, we, we each got a gallon of water a day for washing. And you could just fill that up and leave enough so you could clean your teeth and shave in the morning. And then we'd leave it out in a jerry can all day long so it got hot. And then real quick, you pour it all into that bucket and then turn on the water, get wet, shut it down, lather up, turn it back on and hope you got all the soap out, especially between your, your legs and, and up your butt, got it all cleaned out and then you had a good clean shower. And again, the infantry didn't get that. No. <laughs> So I can't really complain. I really can't. I'm sorry that I interrupted you there, Brian. But I no, thought, no problem. Yeah, that's when I actually could see my my feet. Nowadays, it's a little bit it's a little bit harder. <laughs> you mentioned uh, talking to villagers. I was wondering how often did you encounter uh, Vietnamese people? Oh, we we encountered them a lot, uh, and their famous expression was "No bit, no bit." I don't know. No bit, no bit, and you get, you get so damn sick and tired of hearing that. Uh, Chuck would just look at us like, they're lying, I don't know, no shit, Chuck. 
Oh, no bit, no bit. Where are all the young men? Ah, no bit, no bit. And uh, uh, so we, we encountered them quite a bit. We had an assassinate. I'll, I'll tell you, the Viet Cong were good at this. Uh, two villages down from us, uh, we had an assassination in the morning. Uh, some old man uh, who, before I got there, I got there and, and spent uh, December and part of January at that base. Um, some old man had told us where to find some VC weapons, and it was a, a rusty AK-47 and a rusty Chinese um, version of the Soviet rifle, uh, the SKS, they called it the CKC. Uh, and that was it, and nothing happened. And then the, uh, regim the squadron S2 came up and he says, uh, we need two guys to go and chuck. Uh, somebody assassinated um, our, our guy. And uh, we drew straws and I stayed. Uh, I wish I could have gone. Uh, the guy was slumped over a wooden table on a dirt floor. You know, it was a dirt floor. It was nothing fancy, it was just a little hut. He was slumped over, shot in the back of the head. His daughter was, was uh, not crying, but she was clearly upset. Uh, and it was in the middle of the damn village. And not only that, but the, the militia had a, an outpost like, like across the street from us here. I mean, across the, not even as far as the building across the street. And nobody heard a thing. Nobody saw a thing. Nobody knew a thing. You know, and it, uh, they, we were so goddamn mad we couldn't see straight. I mean, honest to God. It's, and, and then that old, that old manager at the, at the uh, rubber plantation, you know, we, it, was, it was really, fr I'll give you one more. Uh, and if, I, if you want me to show up, you just no, say no. so. We had to go out, we, we found um, the cab used to run what we call trap lines. And they, they had Claymore mines, which if you know what a Claymore is, it's about the size, it's about the size of this piece of paper and it's curved. So you, you knew if you had it against your chest and it was curved like this, that was the side that faced the enemy. And it had a couple thousand steel BBs in it with C4 behind it. And you could work it, it was a remote control with a, with a clacker. And if you, if you ran dead cord um, to, the, to the clacker uh, and then set the clacker out with um, a plastic spoon handle, the, hand, the handle of the spoon between the contact points Okay, drilled a hole into the spoon and then ran a wire from that to a tree. If the Viet Cong came along and popped it, then the spoon pulled, contact, and it's like a giant shotgun. I mean, it's, and, and you could set them up in series so you could have three or four going like from two or three different directions. Uh, M, M Company, which was our tank company, they were the best trap line runners in the, in, in the 11th. They killed five VC, and we knew we got them all because they had all their weapons. And it, I mean, they, they, just, they just died where they got hit. Well, um, uh, one of the cav troops was running a trap line, and the XO of the squadron, no less, came out. He says, who's taking pictures? I said, me. He says, I need you. I need you now. And we jumped on a helicopter. And on the way out, he briefed me. He said, we, we killed three VC. And one of them had three U.S. $100 bills and about, I think it was twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in piastres. And uh, we had a good idea. They were on a rice buying mission um, and they wanted their photographs. So they sent me out and uh, they were on the back of a tank and I, I climbed up and I got their pictures. In fact, I got their pictures at home. I kept copies. Um, one guy's face was just gone. Um, and the other two were, I mean, they were literally frozen in death. I mean, as, as they kicked, you know, it was like that. And I got their pictures. And, and so the commander of the squadron said, you get those developed, you go to every village around here and see if you can find somebody. Because we were always after the Viet Cong government, which we called the VCI, the Viet Cong infrastructure. If you could kill them, that was better than killing a fighter because they, they were, the tax collectors and the alternative school teachers and all that stuff. So we went, uh, Chuck and, uh, uh, and uh, Scoville and I went 
uh, down the road to these different villages and we came to the village, the hamlet uh, chief who was appointed to that position. And he was in a room surrounded by barbed wire and sandbags with guards in the building and outside the building. And he had a little tiny metallic desk and little metallic chairs. And he was the replacement for the guy the VC had killed a couple of months earlier. This is him, pretend I'm him. He didn't want us there. He didn't want to be seen with us. He didn't want us talking to him and he didn't know a damn thing. And he had a good reason because we could not protect him. We couldn't have protected him if we sent a whole squad down there. If they wanted him dead, they were just gonna wait. Then boy, they were good at that. They were good at that. Oh, I got emotional, I'm sorry. No, no. So uh, that's how I interacted with them. Yeah. There were a couple of women, but I don't think we really want to talk about that. Did, did I you, don't. On your base, did they, did they have uh, Vietnam people like work? Oh yeah, them? yeah, that, that was, I thought, the dumbest damned idea in the world, but I wasn't going to complain because they would make your bed and sweep the barracks and, and then report everything to the local Viet Cong. I just, I could not understand what in the hell we were doing with that. But I, I guess it came out of the LBJ idea to give everybody a job. I don't know. The war on poverty in Vietnam, I, <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, one of the things I don't think we've, we've, we've talked a lot about Vietnam guys, but I don't think we've talked about much about tanks in Vietnam. And your unit had tanks. Oh, yeah. So what kind of tanks were there? How were they used? They were uh, M48A1s. Um, and the way the 11th Cav was organized uh, was there were three squadrons and each squadron had uh, a tank company, which was almost purely tanks with some uh, APCs, ACAVs, whatever you want to call them, um, uh, that would go with them. And then everybody else was ACAVs, APCs, um, with usually a Sheridan, light tank. Now the Sheridan light tank was universally hated by almost everybody except the 11th Cav. It was supposed to be, it was supposed to be an airdropped tank, so it had very light armor. It couldn't stop a really determined wasp from penetrating the, the armor. Uh, it was, but the beauty of it was it fired 152 millimeter main gun round, whereas the tank fired a 90 millimeter. And we had a round called a beehive. Artillery had it, tanks had it. A beehive round was packed with steel darts. I don't know how many, but we sometimes used them as nails because you couldn't get nails, but you could break open a beehive and, and use that. And when the round went off, as soon as it cleared the barrel, about say 20 feet, it broke apart. And like canister round in the Civil War, these things just spread. And uh, if you were on the ground as they went past, you needed to be on the ground. Uh, as they went past, it sounded like a zzzz. So that's why they call it a uh, beehive. Um, there is a, I think it's apocryphal, but it was a good story that the 11th once caught a Viet Cong traversing across the wood line. And the tank loaded up a beehive round and, and followed him, let him just a fraction and fired and literally nailed him to a tree and he was nailed so thoroughly they couldn't get him off. Now that, like I said, I think that's apocryphal, but it was a good story. And to top it off, to put the spicing on the cake, they then took a spare um, flechette and an 11th armored cab patch and nailed it to his heart so the little bastards would know who did it. I'm sure you've heard of uh, American, greeting, uh, no, no, American Player Company, playing card company used to make uh, Ace of Spades cards with the unit names on it so they'd know who did it. Well, that was, that was our improvised version of that according to the story. I don't know if it's true, but I doubt it. Anyway, so the tanks would, would uh, they were great. They would, bust, they would bust a hole through the jungle. It was called tank busting. Reverse the turret, go right on through, uh, and then everybody would follow them. The ACAVs couldn't do that. They weren't heavy enough. If they needed to go someplace in a hurry, 
on a road which were usually mined somewhere somehow. They would take the oldest M48 they had, reverse the turret, give it to the driver, everybody else got out, and he would go hell bent for leather down the road, and if he didn't detonate anything, it was clear. <laughs> it, was called, it was called a thunder run. Who was the lucky guy who had to do that? The, whoever, the dri- whoever the driver was. <laughs> I think they had five-man crews. Uh, the, the driver, gunner, loader, I think there were four. Four. I think there were four. Because I, I, I rode in the 48, but um, yeah, I don't remember four. I didn't ride in them very much, so I'm, it's a little hazy. Were they ever affected by weather out over there or the terrain? Well, monsoons. Monsoons just played havoc with, uh, with, I mean, tracked vehicles are supposed to be able to handle that stuff, but. Um, once you're sort of at the tail end of a line of march through jungle, stuff gets ground up. I can give you a perfect example. Around our fire base, uh, the one I, I, I was at in December, so fire base bandit two, um, all the tracks went around it. And uh, I went back to get something from the rear area, took the convoy back and took the convoy back up. And they'd let me out on the outside edge of where everything was. And I made the stupid ass mistake of trying to walk across the open ground to uh, the berm and where my tent was. And I sank into mud, and I am not making this up, I was just above the kneecaps. And um, I thought, now, now this is gonna be ridiculous. This, this is ridiculous. I, it, it, this isn't World War I. <laughs> and it took me 15 minutes to navigate like 30 yards. I, I, fortunately, I had everybody's Christmas mail. That's one of the reasons they sent me back. And I, and I threw the Christmas mail back out ahead of me. <laughs> that was terrible. So mud, mud was a big problem. And, and some of the trees were too big to knock down. And some of the trees had fire ants in them. And when you knocked them down, the fire ants fell on the crew. And that, I hear, was extremely unpleasant because they would just bite you to the point of going, driving you crazy. Yeah, we've heard about those. Yeah. I was curious with your, so you would take pictures. Were you the one who would develop the film or Uh, somebody else did that? I would do it and and sometimes somebody else would do it. It, For example, when I took the dead guys, um, I sent that film back because there was no reason for, for me to do it. And a um, good buddy of mine, Terry Grant, who left Vietnam one day after I did, um, he developed it. And then he used it as, a, as a, a way to get a trip out to the fire base. So he came out and, and visited us. And um, then I, I took the pictures over to the colonel and he was just so happy he couldn't see straight. He even made me put him up. I, I had to give the briefing uh, because my lieutenant was uh, on uh, R&R. And I had to give the briefing, and they were so happy with me, they couldn't see. They said, Sergeant, you take those pictures? Said, yes, sir, I did. Said, oh, damn fine work. Damn fine work. Good job. Oh, thanks, sir. <laughs> you mentioned Patton's son uh, was part of. Um, Before I was there. Well, you say you never, he wasn't there when you were there. No, we, were, we did not cross paths. There's, a, there's so many good stories about him that everybody told. They said that he once, in, in Vietnam, he sent out a Christmas card. And I don't know if this is true or not. I want to believe that it is. He sent out a Christmas card that said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And you opened it up, you know, like when you used to have your family's picture, you know, in the, in the Christmas card. And there was George standing over a pile of dead VC with, with his revolvers in his, in his holster, big smile on his face. I'd very much like to believe that's true, but I don't know. I really don't. Um, well, I was like, uh, did, you, did you run into a lot of high brass people there? I actually, in Saigon, when I, went, when I got transferred to Saigon, I actually went past General, four-star General Creighton Abrams, who was just a gem of a general. He really was. Uh, and I, I was so used to not saluting people because 
at the fire base, they didn't know, oh, don't salute, <laughs> don't salute. Uh, I walked right past, the, I mean, literally, I was three steps past and I went, that was a four-star, that's General Abrams. And he didn't care. He was busy conferring with somebody else. But I thought, man, I could have gotten dressed, dressed down. Oh, dear God. Mm. <laughs> so I saw him and um, um, Colonel Starry, of course, and uh, my majors. And that was about it. That, that didn't meet anybody really famous. Well, did you get to see, did they have any entertainment over there? Like yeah, oh. The USO came over uh, and put on um, uh, a show. Um, they had Miss America's contestants, not Miss America, but Miss America's contestants. And they were very nice to look at. And um, of course, Bob Hope, I never got to see Bob Hope live. I saw him, I saw him on TV because uh, they videotaped it. And when I, when I went back um, Christmas, now, the day after Christmas, uh, to my main base, I was again running supplies. They said, we got Bob Hope on tape. And uh, I watched the show, and it was pretty good. And I want to tell you, uh, Lola Falata, if that name rings any kind of bells with you, uh, black lady, terrific dancer. She did the best dance. And I saw that show because I got back home, and Bob Hope broadcast, you know, outtakes. That dance was not on television. <laughs> it was not there. I don't think it would have gotten past the censors. I was in love with Lola Falana for weeks and weeks. <laughs> you would appreciate dance with your back. Well, it was not the dancing, but okay, let's say it was. <laughs> uh, did you correspond much with your, your, family? your, your family? Oh yeah, I wrote my, wrote my parents. Uh, um, they would say not enough. Uh, but almost every week, and uh, I sanitized a lot of things that I didn't want them to uh, to know. There wasn't that much going on that I needed to sanitize, but um, yeah, I did. Um, my uh, one cousin, Mary Jean, she wrote me a few times. There was a girl I had a huge crush on in college. Uh, she wrote me a couple of times. I think she felt sorry for me. Um, uh, and there was a, a, a young lady I met just before I shipped out um, who now lives on a kibbutz in Israel. She's a Miami grad. Um, and uh, her oldest son is in the reserves in the IDF and her, her daughter is still in the IDF. And uh, her older brother was an infantryman in Vietnam and uh, he lives in California. And she used to write me about him because he was having mental problems and so those were you know and and and, and friends I, you know i'd write to friends um tell them what's going on Co one college professor who i truly admired i wrote to him two or three times he wrote back he was really nice about that uh, so yeah that would be it mostly my parents though did you get to any r&r oh yeah yeah i went to uh a, a guy a guy in my shop uh, Larry Tinderella from Portland, Oregon. Um, keep Oregon green, that was his motto. Uh, he and I went to uh, Taiwan, we went to Taipei, and um, uh, we, had a, we had a very pleasant time. Very pleasant time. You know, they, the other name for R&R &R was I&I, &I, intercourse and intoxication. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. And I also, I also managed when I was in Saigon because they, are, they were running such a loose ship um, and nobody gave a crap what I did because I was just filing maps. Uh, I, got a, I got a week's leave. I wheedled a week's leave uh, to Hawaii. Um, so that was, that was fun. They didn't need me. I could have gone home at that point and nobody would have cared. But. You know, the guys that we talked to, they, they flew into Oakland like you did, but a lot of them were earlier, like 68. I don't think we've had anybody, or 71, it's a little later, but were there still people like, I don't know if you saw any of this, but people protesting or anything like that? We, that we landed at Travis Air Force Base, so I didn't see any of that at all. Um, there was, of course, a lot of racial problems in the Army, and... Um, there was this one black guy on the bus after we got off the Freedom Bird and we're going into, you know, customs and, 
and, and whatnot and, and divide up into groups. And he was bad mouthing some poor lieutenant. And the lieutenant was just sitting there going, you know what? I'm going home. Screw this. Talk away. But um, that's, that's and, and I didn't blame the black guy either. I mean, he, from his perspective, it was all a bunch of horse crap. So but that was, I, no, I never saw anybody mistreat anybody. Now, my, my buddy Ray, the one who has Agent Orange, he was doing factory work for a while when he got out. He got out six months after I did. Uh, and he went to work at uh, Champion Paper and Fiber, a paper mill in Hamilton. And uh, some guys would throw firecrackers at him while he was uh, working because he'd jump. Uh, and uh, he, he, we were roommates at the time. He'd come home, he would be really pissed. But he said, you know what? I'm out now. What was his name? Ray Seal. Ray Steel. Seal, S-E-A-L. S-E-A-L. -E oh, Seal. Uh -huh. Seal, yeah. Yeah, his dad flew, uh, flew the, in the Berlin airlift. And uh, one of his boys was a boat driver for uh, the Navy SEALs. He just got out. So he lives in, in uh, Washington State now. So later on, you taught classes about Vietnam? Oh, yeah, yeah. Was that something you initiated? Was that oh, no, 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 no. Well, to begin with, it was 20th century U.S. history when I started. And that was U.S. history. So I always had perfect cover. Um, and uh, when I taught military history, of course, um, that was the last war until we decided to get into a, a run on let's, let's invade this place. Um, so um, I always had a chance to talk about it, to present pros and cons, uh, to give it from the um, infantryman's perspective, although I was not an infantryman. Uh, and there were guys, uh, you know, who were taking that class, and in the regular class too, whose parents had been in Vietnam. And they, they would bring in stuff or say, my dad said to say, blah, 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 blah. And uh, uh, so, yeah. And I had a couple of guys I went to high school with. I had their kids and they went to Vietnam and they, dad said to say hi. Okay. Well, I guess, I mean, you saw, you were, you, you were in Vietnam and you had your, uh, you know, experience and your, you know, what you saw. But then I guess with that class, you probably had to learn a lot more of what was going elsewhere in different areas. In the oh, yeah. And we, we spent, you know, the peace movement and uh, um, spent a lot of time on the diplomatic uh, efforts to uh, end the war, you know, the Paris peace talks. And uh, also the, how we got into it. I mean, that, that was a whole week in itself. It was explaining, you know, the domino theory and why we thought this was going to happen and that was going to happen. And the unfortunate interdiction of Kennedy's life and Johnson wanting to win re-election. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I think, I think I covered it as well as I could. I never felt like I left anything out, but um, that does not mean I satisfied everyone's point of view. Well, great. Well, I, I think I got all the questions I wanted to ask. Okay. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. Well, we've uh, reached the end of our, our, our interview. I, I kind of feel like there's another whole two or three hours here, but... Yeah, you can get me started on all sorts of crap. But at, at, this, <laughs> at this point, Henry Lubbers, I want to thank you so much for your service. And to Ray, our you yours. And, uh, and thank you for your patriotism to our country. Well, I, it comes with the territory as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So. Thank you.